Okay, I think we've got everybody here, so we'll go ahead and begin. So again, thank you for joining us uh, today. We're very excited because uh, we have a partner with us today uh, from Glue, and I know you're going to really enjoy this. And again, just really appreciate everybody taking time out of the really busy schedules uh, to do this today. And we're going to be covering five questions that banks and credit unions should be asking about multi-factor authentication. I'm Jonathan Hutcherson. I'm the founder and CEO of Exclamation Labs, the maker of the Provision Identity Access Management System, which is catered pretty much just to financial institutions. Uh, just a few quick housekeeping items before we get going. Uh, if you could please keep yourself muted. Uh, just don't want to pick up a whole lot of background noise. Uh, any questions you have during the entire presentation or even afterwards, please put them in the questions Q&A panel over. I think it's on the right-hand side of your screen. And we want to take some time at the end of this presentation to come back and answer as many of your questions as we possibly can. And just a reminder that today's session is being recorded, so we'll uh, share it with everyone afterwards. So just kind of jumping right in today, I'd like to introduce our first panelist, Mike Schwartz, who is the founder and CEO of Glue. Uh, residing, in Austin, hi Mike. residing in Austin, Texas, Mike is a domain expert on the digital authentication and application security. He's the founder of Glue, an open source software vendor whose platform is used in over 60 countries. He's active in the development of open standards for digital identity. And Mike is actually the co-author of the book Securing the Perimeter, Deploying Identity and Access Management with Free Open Source Software and hosts the podcast, Open Source Underdogs, which publishes interviews with the leaders of successful open source companies. And trust me, uh, as somebody who hasn't been in this field of identity management quite as long as Mike, I often find myself referencing this book. It's kind of the definitive go-to manual for all things identity related. So again, thank you, Mike, for being here today. Thanks, Jonathan. We also have Brandon Powers with us, uh, and we're going to hear from Brandon a little bit later on. Brandon is the lead developer here at Exclamation Labs and very much has a focus on our provision identity access management application. Brandon's been involved with every provision installation we've worked on, so he's quite the expert on deploying identity management specifically for financial institutions. So thank you for being here, Brandon. Yeah, thanks a lot, Jonathan. Glad to be here. Real quick uh, overview of what we're going to do today, what we're going to cover. We're going to walk through what using MFA in today's financial sector looks like. We're going to talk about how to evaluate a multi-factor solution uh, based on usability, deployability, security features, scalability, and affordability in order to make the best decision for your bank or your organization. And then finally, we're going to look at how MFA uh, how using MFA together with an identity management system can really enhance your security. So Mike, let's start with you. If you could kind of start us off by telling us a little bit about how banks typically use multi-factor authentication. Sure. Let me just share my screen here. And um, well, let's start from the basics. Most of the audience probably knows all this stuff, but let me just start from the beginning. You, you might know that two-factor authentication was defined uh, a long time back um, well by NIST um, in a, a document called 863. And they defined two-factor authentication as two of the following, something you know, something you have, something you are. And what I find sometimes people forget is that to that to, this definition of two-factor doesn't allow you to have two of the same things. So if you have a phone, a push notification to a phone and you put it and you have, it gives you a token, maybe that's two, two of the same things, two something you have. You have your phone and your phone has this app running on it. So you need two, two different um, modes, let's say. But, um, you know, so there's no lack of, 2FA technologies out there. You know, over the years, there's been a lot of innovation in the area of two-factor authentication. So, um, you know, you might remember these changing numbers like the RSA key fob was one of the first ones. Um, this is called one-time password. And this can be either one-factor or two-factor. So if you put in a PIN number plus the, 
plus the code, that's something you know, your PIN number, plus something you have, the token. Um, we've seen a lot of innovation around mobile applications, pushing notifications to your phone. Um, that proves that you have possession of the phone. Um, there's a whole new um, standards category called FIDO, Fast Identity Online. And this has introduced a number of authentication technologies um, that can be either a USB token that you plug into your computer, um, but it can also be software. For example, Windows Hello uses FIDO2. Um, and this is a token that you can see that actually combines um, the biometric. So it, instead of pressing the button, you present your fingerprint. And so it's something you have the token plus something you are the fingerprint. Um, but FIDO is interesting because um, it is um, it is built, it's getting built into a lot of hardware. Um, biometric, um, is, there's a lot of excitement around biometric. Um, biometric has gone mainstream. Uh, most smartphones have a biometric sensor in them. And biometric has good usability. So sometimes usability maybe um, is better even than the security um, because most biometrics, you know, you have to trade how much do you train it and how accurate is it to how much it fails. So there's trade-offs in biometric, but most consumers are familiar with biometric. And then we have older, older technologies like um, smart cards um, used mostly by the government um, and even SMS tokens. A lot of banks are sending one-time codes via SMS. So it, I think what we see is that if, um, if we wanna see more adoption of two-factor authentication, the problem is not there aren't enough two-factor authenticators. This is just a small overview of the diversity. There's probably 100 plus different uh, vendors producing 2FA uh, products. Um, one innovation that we've seen recently has been around um, not two-factor authentication, but two-step authentication. So you could have a two-factor, one-step authentication. For example, the old OTP tokens, I mentioned we put in the PIN number plus the code, but we put that into one form. So that goes into, you know, in the web page, we enter our username um, plus the PIN number plus the OTP, we hit submit. So that's a two-factor, one-step authentication. But what we're seeing is, is that um, websites are putting users through multi-step workflows. And the reason for that is that the more steps uh, you put a user through, the more context you have to detect fraud and the more flexibility you have to add additional steps if you feel like there's, a, there's risk um, in the transaction. So a good example of a multi-step authentication is Google. So in step one of Google, they ask me for a username or your email address or your phone number. Basically, this is called identifier first authentication. So there's no password here, just the identifier, let's say email. Then in step two, they ask me for my password. And then in step three, they say, okay, maybe I don't recognize this browser. Um, I need you to enter in your token, press the button on your token or use one of your other two-factor devices. But So this is actually a two-factor, three-step authentication flow. Um, but this is a really interesting innovation because it enables us, let's say we detect the person logs in with their password and we see it's from outside the country and that seems unusual. On the fly, we can say, well, in this case, we're gonna give you another step. So we can implement what we call adaptive authentication techniques, which allow us to change the number of steps uh, based on the risk. Um, so one of the, the major, um, attack strategies for hackers has been phishing. So hackers send a bunch of emails uh, with links. Um, inevitably, a certain percentage of users are, are, are um, tricked to click on this link and no amount of training will, will fix this. The right message at the right time, um, you know, when you're, when you're you, 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 there's, it's just luck that some people will click on it. Um, this diagram that I have, um, it's a detail of, of a phishing attack um, that um, was implemented against a bank that resulted in, in theft of around $20 million. And um, so the, the real danger here is what we call the man in the middle attack, or you might see it MITM is how we um, abbreviate it. 
But um, the way that the attack worked um, is that the hackers um, actually broke into the DNS of the bank and they substituted, they created a DNS entry pointing to their web server. So like login53.bank.com and then they got a certificate from a real SSL certificate vendor that's in the browser so that they, they got a certificate for this name. So, and then they sent out a bunch of phishing emails and said, you know, log into your bank. And I don't remember what the message was, but when bank customers clicked on this link, um, well, they didn't recognize the, the server, you know, but they said, okay, this is a message. This is a link going to the bank and I see the certificate is green. I must be safe. So they click on the link and they get to the attacker website. And what the attacker is doing is proxying. So it's getting requests from the, from the customer's browser and sending them to the real bank site. So the bank asks for the password. Um, the um, hacker plays the password to the bank. The bank asks for an OTP, a one-time code. Maybe the bank sends an SMS to the user and the user says, oh, well, I am logging in. So I'm going to enter my SMS um, um, into, into the browser. So the hacker gets the SMS, the hacker replays the SMS to code. Um, the key point here is that an out of band notification does not protect you from a man in the middle attack. Um, so, and this, this applies um, whether you're um, using a, um, a phone, an SMS sent OTP or a push notification or using a hardware token um, all of those, an email, all of those mechanisms are, are susceptible to a man in the middle attack. So one of the interesting properties of, of certain authentication technologies is what we call anti-phishing. Um, so FIDO in particular and smart cards, um, because they make a connection directly from the customer's browser to the website, they prevent um, they prevent this type of attack um, using um, pr public and private key challenge response protocol. Um, you must have possession of the private key. So there's no way for the hacker to proxy um, this. Um, so that's an uh, that's important thing to keep in mind um, when, when you're a bank because of uh, phishing and this man in the middle attack is gonna be one of the, the main differentiators between different types of uh, authentication technologies. So when you, you look at all those, those you know, different ways that we could implement uh, multi-factor authentication, um, what we realize is, is that um, there's, no, there's no perfection here. Um, the uh, two-factor authentication is, it's really about risk mitigation. And so what we need to do is choose um, between, a, we could need to figure out, so which of these technologies gives us the best security usability and deployability. Um, we could also think about deployability impacting scalability and cost and sort of um, you could break deployability out um, further. Um, but um, Microsoft did an interesting study a couple of years back. It's more like a, it was more like a study of studies where they compare different types of authentication technologies, um, passwords, uh, tokens, phone, biometric. Um, and they looked at the usability, deployability, and security of each of these um, mechanisms. And they, they had a sort of interesting insight, which was that while some technologies were more secure and some technologies were more usable than passwords, let's say, that no um, technology was more deployable and that basically there's this rule of thumb in, in, in IT that for people to move to a new technology, the new technology has to be 10 times better than the old technology. And marginal gains are not sufficient is what they said. Um, so, but basically I think this is sort of what we're seeing um, in, um, in, in the adoption of two-factor authentication. Nobody denies that passwords are not secure. Um, something like 80% of the breaches are a result of breach, of, of breach passwords. So everyone knows passwords are bad. Um, usability is not great. If you ever tried to type in a long password on your mobile phone keyboard, I'm sure you probably um, can envision a better user experience. 
Um, so password usability is not great. Password security is not great. So it has to be something about deployability. So at Glue, we've been asking ourselves, what is it about deployability that's so hard with two-factor authentication that's preventing adoption? Um, and the answer we came about, or that we really um, figured out over the last 10 years is that it's really um, recovery is one of the big issues of, with, with um, the rollout of 2FA at scale, um, whether that's to employees or customers. And the, so when you, when you lose your password, the, every identity management tool has some type of workflow for lost password. Um, maybe you get asked some questions, maybe you get sent an email link to recover your password, but, but it's known how you recover passwords. But how do you recover these more um, secure technologies without degrading the security? So for example, if I, um, if I have some fancy biometric crypto um, you know, authentication token, hardware token, but then I can reset it by have sending an email well, the hackers won't try and break the um, the crypto tool. They'll they'll try and um, hack the the recovery process. So you can say that the recovery process can really be the Achilles heel of two-factor authentication. Um, so how do we address the recovery process? Well, one issue is is that as I was saying, we need two roughly equal um, keys in order to do self-service recovery. So I, I show this, this picture of, it's, it's a picture from uh, the Sistine Chapel of Peter getting the keys. And I always point out he's getting two keys um, because even Peter needs a backup key. And these keys are roughly the same um, strength. So, um, so I think when you think about rolling out um, 2FA, Think about rolling out customers two tokens. So they have a backup token. You have, when you get a car, when you buy a car, you always get two car keys. Um, when, you, when you move into your house or your apartment, um, if they give you one key, I'm sure the first thing you do is go out to the locksmith and get them to make you a backup key. So, um, so having a backup key is important. And not that, it, and, and I would also say that, um, that I think people need to, although passwords were free, and that's an aspect of deployability, um, that it actually, um, if I'll spend, you know, $10 to make a key for my house or $100 to buy a, a, a house key, I think the impact of my car getting stolen um, is not that great. Um, my insurance broker will, my agent will actually have me in a rental car by like the afternoon. So the impact of a, of a security of my car getting stolen is not that great, yet I have these really strong physical keys. But somehow, um, shouldn't I need a, also a strong credential um, to, um, to lock up my money, um, which uh, somebody getting into my bank account, um, especially for me as a business owner, might have a huge impact and be really inconvenient. Um, so I think I'd be willing to spend, if, I, if I'm willing to spend $10 on a house key, I think I'd be willing to spend $10 on a, on a key to lock up my, computer, my, my money. Um, then, then the second question is, okay, so now that we have this recovery key, how do we use the recovery key? And um, I used Google before. Google's doing a really good job in two-factor authentication. Um, and the, the other nice thing about Google is they're doing it at scale. So what they're doing is getting a huge amount of testing. And when you look at how Google does two-factor authentication, they allow me to enroll multiple credentials. Actually, there's more, they also have a phone app, um, they have recovery codes, um, they have um, SMS. Um, but in this case, I'm just showing, um, I've registered a number of the FIDO keys um, at, um, at uh, Google, and I also use their OTP app. Um, but we like this idea that I'm able to register multiple credentials um, um, at, the, at, at the provider. And if I lose one, I delete it and I, I add a new one. But the question was, is how, what do banks do? So, well, you're not Google and Google's not selling this app. So what do you do if you're a bank and you need something like this? And that's why we built this app called Glucasa. Um, and Casa is like a self-service portal 
for your credentials. And you can see in this example, um, this, we've configured FIDO key, keys. U2F is a, one of the FIDO protocols. Superglue is a, a mobile push-based um, app, um, one-time password, and, and SMS. Um, but the idea is um, it's similar to Google, but as allowing you to self-host this solution to enable users or employees um, to register multiple credentials so that they can, um, if they lose one, they can, um, they can recover. So I think that's it um, for, for, for 2FA. Let me hand back um, to Jonathan. Thank you, Mike. Uh, that was great. Uh, it, what I'd like to do now is bring in Brandon Powers. Brandon, now that we've talked about rolling out multi-factor authentication, how can banks integrate MFA into their governance structure, if you will? Sure, that's a great question, Jonathan. So uh, core to identity access management uh, and identity governance is this concept of managing identity uh, access to systems and applications and system network resources for an organization. Uh, it provides mechanisms to determine and enforce who has access to what, essentially. So in some cases, it may even uh, facilitate some credentialing or authentication to those services. Now, this is kind of where MFA fits in. You, know, you, you as an organization, a bank, credit union, similar, you want to maintain secure access. I mean, it's all about security, um, just as Mike was explaining. And you want to maintain that security, that secure access to all the applications, everything that an employee would have to access. So uh, as Mike explained, um, MFA is a key component to secure authentication. And we want to have uh, MFA and access management to work hand in hand together. So where I, identity access management grants the user access and entitlements to those various servers, uh, services and applications, MFA is providing a heightened level of authentication to those services. Additionally, um, by uh, integrating your MFA solution with identity access management, uh, we can automatically and securely provision uh, your identities to the MFA solution itself. So, Brandon, just so everybody's on the same page, can you kind of briefly walk us through what deploying MFA in conjunction with IAM might look and feel like? Absolutely. So, uh, let's start by looking at what happens, uh, you know, what it looks like when there is no identity access management system in place. And then we'll add it in. So, typically in this scenario, you're doing a lot of manual work, right? Your, your team is uh, onboarding uh, new employees and uh, permissions for those employees to various systems. You're managing all that information somewhere. Where are you managing it? Um, sometimes even in massive spreadsheets, which of course is prone to uh, human error in a great way. Uh, managing the, any changes to those, uh, those access privileges in a spreadsheet doesn't lend itself well to uh, providing up-to-date information for auditing uh, and, and managing that access either. So some of the main purposes of identity access management is to provide reliable mechanisms uh, to accurately and, and automatically enforce those provisioning rules, uh, the user access to various systems. So without an identity access management system, your, your SSO identity provider, your MFA solutions, they're just additional systems that an employee needs access to. You know, their identity needs to be provisioned to them. Their MFA uh, account needs to be managed. And so you just have to add that, you know, tack it onto your IT team's daily routine. You know, it's, it's another responsibility to take on. So in this scenario, as you can see in the diagram, our system administrators are seen here not only adding employee access to many of your common banking systems like an FIS, uh, IBS core banking platform or services like DocuSign, but you're also managing the identity provider for SSO or your MFA solutions. So now let's jump ahead and go ahead and integrate our identity access management system. Uh, when this is in place, it's acting as your single source of, of record for your IT access. You know, the HR team is still gonna enter all the information into your bank's HR platform, and that data is gonna feed into um, the identity access management uh, system. And then it's gonna automatically provision those user accounts. You can see it's doing it here on behalf of our system administrators. This new process requires a lot less time, usually fewer people to be even involved in, the, in that management process of provisioning user accounts. So now our identity access management system is automatically and systematically provisioning employee identities to not only systems like IBS, uh, DocuSign, but also your SSO identity provider or your MFA solution. 
uh, and with those solutions uh, for security integrated um, with other banking applications, with other services, uh, your employees are automatically both granted the appropriate access to a service, but also with the um, secure authentication to those services as well. Um, so now they can authenticate who they are, uh, you know, just as Mike was explaining earlier with two-factor and multi-factor authentication steps. Thank you, Brandon. That was great. Um, it, we're getting towards the end of this, but before we're completely wrapped up and taking questions, I wanted to make sure we heard from our Director of Sales and Partnerships, John Jacobs. John brings about 16 years of fintech experience helping banks grow and become more profitable. Some of you may know John from his 10 years of leading sales at eOriginal, and we are very glad to have John on our team. So John, could you walk us through some of the benefits of an identity access management system and how IAM can actually enhance the security of MFA? Hey, Jonathan, uh, absolutely. Uh, I'll try to keep it short and sweet here. Uh, you know, our core focus, of course, is partnering with community banks and credit unions to solve these problems. So with that in mind, many of the benefits directly align with problems facing uh, financial institutions today, right? Provision is one single pane of glass um, or interface for tracking every system's data access point. Uh, it controls every um, system's user and who has authorized access and easily produces audit ready documentation and, and reports. Um, things like stores full, full audit logs, um, so not just sampling the data like some of the other systems that you might see out there, but a, really a complete history of all the actions and all the important actions to who, what, when, where, and how. Um, it has a complete workflow system for onboarding, um, so if you want to set future hire dates and things like that, it can be easily done and easily automated uh, through provision. Um, and it's really the only IAM that allows you to include systems that don't have full API or, you know, ones that you might not use uh, too often. And of course it can be deployed pretty quickly, uh, typically within uh, 90 days or so. Uh, most importantly, one of the major benefits that you don't see on this side is again, provisions focus on helping the financial services industry to solve these specific problems. And we're actively out there building financial services applications and connectors to, to serve this particular community. So we're very much part of it. Thank you, John. And I can certainly see the efficiency that provision enables, but it seems like both MFA and IAM have kind of a common overlap, if you will. And that's around security. Does that sound about right? It, yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I'm, I'm usually a direct cost benefit guy, but, you know, of course, there's a powerful uh, cybersecurity benefit to a really good uh, multi-factor authentication plan partnered with provision. Uh, not only does provision end up helping uh, banks to, to be more efficient in using their kind of sparse IT resources smarter, uh, but because the solution makes access, access account management um, seamless, uh, it's much more secure, too. Uh, so the uh, data between the systems encrypted um, and provisions ability to monitor uh, kind of your outdated or your legacy systems, as well as even the modern API enabled systems, it really reduces the bank's um, exposure. I I've worked with and have seen financial institutions who've had to go through cybersecurity remediation, spend over a million dollars uh, to address a breach. It's not pretty and it's definitely not cheap. Um, provision shuts down so many of the access point back doors uh, that are usually left open. Um, and it's these access points that lead to breaches um, in most of the cases. So my perspective, uh, it, it should be a no brainer for most banks to install if purely for security reasons. Thank you, John. Uh, so let's wrap up and uh, take a real quick look at some of the key takeaways from today's conversation. SMS text messaging for two and multi-factor authentication is insecure and prone to hacks. When considering an MFA solution, it's important to understand the relationship between deployability, usability, and security. Your backup key or your reset is just as important as your primary MFA approach. Glucasa allows your users to easily and completely manage their MFA solution and can be rebranded to look just like your company. Certification reviews and audit prep can be automated with provision, which reduces cost. And finally, real-time reporting serves as a constant log of changes for auditors to review. And so 
with that, let's go ahead and maybe take some questions. Um, I'm going to start with, uh, let me see here. Okay, so we've got an anonymous question. It says our bank has about 110 systems. How many systems does a normal provision bank get started with and how do they prioritize? Uh, John wanted, or actually, let's give that one to Brandon. Sure, Jonathan. Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, yeah, 120 systems, 110 systems. Um, uh, we've worked with banks who've uh, had 200 plus systems. Uh, and of course, each of them are important on some level, right? So uh, it's, it's really about prioritizing which ones are most critical. What are going to have the biggest uh, potential attack vector? What, where's the risk? Um, and so we work with banks, credit unions to determine this, help them to figure that out. And we usually start with a good solid 10 to 12 um, core systems that we want to integrate the identity access management system with and start off there. Uh, some of the most common ones are things like your core banking platform or uh, directory services like Active Directory or Benelda. Thank you, Brandon. Uh, the next question it says, uh, sorry to be confused, but what's the right sequencing for a bank? Should we do multi-factor authentication or identity access management first? And Mike, do you want to take that one? Sure. Um, this is a question that I've, people have been asking for, for I think, for, <laughs> since IDM and IAM got, got started. Um, I think I'm a little biased on this, on this question because I think that um, I, I think the, I, the MFA and especially setting the right direction for applications in terms of um, what standards to use for authentication is uh, really important in order to provide developers with a roadmap so they can start working um, on new projects and also that it could play into the selection of products um, if you're using off-the-shelf software or procuring SaaS services. I think um, that having um, um, knowing you know that you need to support OpenID or Connect or SAML, that could be an important criteria for you selecting a certain piece of software. So I, I, my, my take on it has always been um, that I would look at um, doing the, the access management slash SSO slash MFA project, um, um, project first, and then um, taking the time to, to, um, to figure to um, take on the IDM project, um, which is not entirely a technology problem. There's also business um, um, discussions around that and um, a lot, a lot of planning and and coordination, and and so I, I, I think that the maybe the MFA SSO is the low hanging fruit and is more tactical, and the and the IDM is 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 um, uh, maybe can come second. But uh, I know Jonathan and your team maybe might have a different perspective on that. Brandon, do you want to weigh in on that? Sure, I can. Um, I mean, I, I completely agree with what Mike was saying there. Um, it, you know, it's like I was uh, answering you the previous question, you know, determining what the what systems uh, have the highest risk, right? And so, you know, that's what you're looking at when you're um, deciding which systems do I integrate with identity access management. So it, it's kind of comes down to the same thing, I think, you know, with with integrating your MFA solution. You know, you're, you're looking at securing authentication to various services. Um, as even uh, John mentioned a little while ago, um, uh, you're you're wanting to close the back door on uh, various uh, you know instances where you know somebody else gets access to a system, um, you know can wreak havoc. And so with identity access management in place, you can close those back doors. You can deprovision accounts when an employee leaves the the organization. Uh, if they shift job positions, you can close the the right doors and open up the right doors. Um, so you're managing that access side by side. So I think that's a really critical element, and and it comes down to managing or determining what where the risk factors come in. That's great. Thank you. Um, next one is from Sonia, and she asks, "Is there any kind of a password vault?" slash safe that will integrate with Glucasa. And we're missing that piece in the middle. So Mike, obviously that one's for you. <laughs> so at, at Glu, we, we've decided that we don't want to get into the password vault space. Um, it's already an, an established mature market. And um, so, um, so we haven't, um, we, we decided we didn't want that in the, in the product. 
Thank you, Mike. Um, and then one more here. It says, uh, and, and John, I think this one's going to be for you. It says, we're a mid-sized credit union. When I got a price from another IAM system, they were so far over what we could afford, I didn't even share it with my boss. How are other banks dealing with the cost issue? Well, that's, that's a really good question. And, you know, one of the reasons that we're able to work with community banks and credit unions is because we're really designing a solution that's specific to their needs. And that includes subscription-based pricing. It includes um, working with the, the credit unions and banks to, to really be consultative, um, understand what their needs and what their problems are, and make sure that we're working with them to, de to design a solution that absolutely fits their needs. That way they're not paying for maybe connectors that they might not need. They're not paying for functions that they might not use. They're, they're really going to pay for things that absolutely benefit their institution. So we have a survey that we can work with credit unions and, and financial institutions to, to send out and really understand some of their pain points and uh, getting that over to them and getting a proposal together is actually pretty easy. Um, so anybody that's interested, definitely uh, just let us know. And one more uh, just came in, and this is uh, from Joseph. And John, I'm going to let you take this one again, yet, uh, again but uh, it says, is provision available as a service yet? Yeah, so we're we're on our uh, we're on our way there. If you, um, uh, Joe, good to see you on. Uh, so as a uh, software as a service uh, platform, that's kind of coming out in one of our future versions. So to today we have our on-premise installation, and when we get to software as a service, which is really coming pretty soon, it's going to be a pretty uh, seamless transition. So anybody that has our on-premise install, we can work with to seamlessly transition onto that. Uh, Thanks for asking that question, Joe. And believe me, we are very hard at work on that and lots of good stuff coming down the pipe. So thank you. All right. These were great questions. Thank you all very much for uh, participating today. And we invite you to follow our LinkedIn pages for Glue, Provision, and Exclamation Labs so that you can stay up to date on the latest identity, security, and fintech news. Again, thank you for coming. Uh, we're going to send out a recording. And if you have any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to any one of us directly. Stay safe and stay well. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone.